Welcome everyone. I think it's 3.01 p.m. So we will, we will stop because we are going to have a good discussion, hopefully about sparkling wine. So let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for this new webinar. Um, so thanks for being with us. We hope you will enjoy this webinar and we develop knowledge and learn skills to be used in your vineyard and winery. So I'm Dr. Aude Watrelot, an assistant professor of enology in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. And I'm co-hosting this webinar with my friend and colleague, Drew Horton, a research specialist of enology at the University of Minnesota Grapes Breeding and um, Enology Project. So before starting the webinar, just a few um, instructions. So the webinar is being recorded. Uh, right now, and that would be available. The recording would be available on YouTube um, in few um, days, I think. Uh, the previous recordings are already available, uh, and I will put the link into the chat box just to make sure you have access to that. Uh, if you have any question, please use the Q and A box or the chat box uh, that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, by clicking on the three dots, you should be able to see uh, to write anything you have. And the question will be answered during the uh, discussion we will have with the panel. Uh, at the end also of the webinar, we, you will receive an email to complete the Quadric survey uh, about how we did and what we would need to change for future webinars. So please just take a few minutes to complete that survey. That's really important for us. So today we will have only one presentation, but a great presentation, uh, followed by a winemaker panel discussion about sparkling winemaking techniques, the pros, the cons, and any specific tips that you may need for the future. So presenting today will be um, Michael Jones from Scott Laboratories. And then during the panel discussion, we will be joined by Andy Morse from Breezy Hills Vineyards in Iowa. Christy Walker and Ken Fulker from Walker Homestead Farm and Vineyard in Iowa. Josie Boyle from Moose Sparkling Wine Company in Minnesota. So let's start by, with our first presenter today, Michael Jones. And I will leave uh, Drew to introduce him. I will introduce uh, Michael Jones. I've known Michael for many years and uh, uh, he's always uh, very informative and very entertaining. And I'll just remind everybody that Michael Jones, uh, he's got about uh, 35 years of experience, uh, 19, 19 of those years at Domaine Chandon making sparkling wine. Uh, Michael came on board with Scott Laboratories in 2007 uh, with more than 35 years of winemaking experience under his belt. Since then, he has shared his wealth of knowledge uh, with North America by traveling extensively to trade shows and seminars throughout the country, uh, many times as a speaker. Michael's a UC Davis graduate. Uh, he has lived and worked in Burgundy, France, and in the Hunter Valley in Australia. Uh, domestically, Michael built his experience at uh, Nova Vine, uh, Hanzel Vineyards, uh, and at Camus as well. Uh, as I mentioned, he spent 19 years at Domaine Chandon, uh, where he wore a multitude of hats and was involved with uh, vineyard, uh, vineyards operations, uh, winemaking, laboratory, I uh, was part of the team that established the wine education program. Prior to his start in the wine industry, Michael spent a year traveling cross, con cross country by freight train, stopping to work on a shrimp boat in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, pitching hay in San Antonio, Texas, and selling art in New Orleans. Michael, we're ready to hear your presentation. I forgot that I told you all that stuff. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So you should be able to share. I just press, I just press share and uh, now I oh there, okay. Very good. Oh my god. So nothing is showing up. Nothing is showing up? No. Huh. And yet I did press share and I have the uh this this screen here. Let's see. Let me try again. Mm -hmm. Share. It's coming. Right now, is something showing up now? Yes. So put the PowerPoint. Yep. And now? 
Yes. Can you make in presenter mode? Yes. That uh, little, I need that, to little, get, that little screen uh, on the lower right. Oh, uh, there. No, it's for me. There. There okay. you go. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, on my, my computer's a little backwards. It was on the upper left instead of the lower right. So, uh, bubbles. Uh, actually, bubbles is my first love of wine, in wine. Uh, to the extent that in 1991, that was actually one of the best years of my life, uh, in that I did not have a single day from January 1st to December 31st that did not, where I did not consume at least one glass of sparkling wine. Anyway, in the U.S., the most important thing uh, is to understand what sparkling wine is. To call wine sparkling wine in the U.S., you it must contain 3.92 grams per liter of CO2, a minimum, and that's created by fermentation in a closed container. Uh, if it is artificially infused with CO2, it is considered uh, to be carbonated wine. Uh, methods of production. Uh, traditional method, this is what goes into the making of all champagne. Uh, pet nat, and we're, I'm going to get more into descriptions of these as we progress. Uh, pet nat is the oldest method for the product, it's the method ancestral, and it preceded the traditional method for making a sparkling wine. Uh, Charmat method is, is a sort of the second newest method for making sparkling wine. It was developed in Italy in, uh, and then at the end of the, the 19th century and then perfected in France, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, there were two other kinds that, of of means of making sparkling wine that we're not going to cover, transfer and transversage. Uh, basically, they require a lot of fancy equipment. There's only two transfer operations in the US, one at Bronco in California and the other at uh, Pleasant Valley up in New York. And it requires a tremendous amount of very expensive equipment that can take, all of which can take high pressure. And then, uh, so of the things that we're covering, I'm going to end up with carbonation because there is a lot of that going on. And carbonation is actually can be a lot of fun. Uh, when I was traveling along around the Mediterranean, especially in Italy, in the middle of summer, you were always for your white wine in a restaurant, given the option of having a slightly frisante or slightly carbonated wine. And it always made like, you got a slightly carbonated vermentino on a 90 degree day. It was just a wonderful, wonderful, refreshing beverage. So uh, here you have a chart that put together. You don't have to memorize this, but this is shows you the interrelationship of the different methods and how they come about. Uh, since I'm going to go into each of these methods, I'm not going to linger here. So that, uh, but uh, especially, you know, if you go on to the, I, I guess, pull up this presentation later on, or also Ode and uh, Drew have this, uh, it gives you an idea of how each of these uh, means of making a, a sparkling or carbonated wine relates to the other. Okay, we're gonna start with the traditional method and the traditional method basically goes back to probably the late 17th century. Uh, here you're working with, you start with the grapes, of course, you, and you're making a base wine, a non-sparkling base wine. The important thing here, here and you're going to see this with, I think, every method, the quality of grapes is so important. One of the reasons that some of the other methods are looked upon as cheaper is because people see the, those other methods as being a way of producing something really fast and really cheap, and so they use really, really cheap grapes. Grapes are all important, whether you're making sparkling wine or still wine. And so you're starting out with very high quality grapes. Uh, you 
one of the things you're doing with uh, sparkling wine is you're picking the grapes younger. Quite often, as early as a month or even longer before you're picking the same grapes for a non-sparkling wine. You're making your base wine. You want it to be a quick, clean fermentation. Uh, it's traditionally, uh, like for instance, when I worked at Domaine Chandon, we'd ferment it about uh, mid to high 60s. And we wanted a, the yeast to be happy. We wanted a clean fermentation that would go to completion. And we then would rack off and stabilize the wine as soon as possible. Any fault in there, even something very subtle that in a still wine might be considered a little bit of complexity, might be conceivably could be so magnified by bubbles as to make a finished sparkling wine undrinkable. Um, one of the things I did sort of leave out in, in, in simplifying this is in traditional champagne making, you have a number of different base wines made. And the blending together is a, vi a vital aspect of traditional champagne making in the champagne region. When you have your finished blend of your base wine, you now add to that yeast and sugar. Uh, when you're adding sugar, basically, you look about four grams per liter of sugar will equate to one atmosphere of pressure. So under standard conditions, traditionally 24 grams per liter is added six, so that you get six atmospheres under standard conditions after the second fermentation. Uh, the wine, sugar and yeast goes into bottle, a temporary cap goes over, usually a crown cap, and usually a crown cap specifically made for sparkling wine. Uh, the second fermentation takes place. Usually it will be anywhere from four to six weeks, uh, after which the yeast dies and settles down to the side of the bottle. It is the wine aging on that that gives a lot of the complexity to sparkling wine. It releases proteins, peptides, amino acids into the wine. Uh, a lot of these, like especially the proteins, really help along with the proteins naturally occurring in the grapes, they help with the quality of the bubbles, the longevity of the bubbles, and the quality of the foam on top of the wine when you pour it. Uh, in France, minimum of 15 months is needed aging. Uh, I believe it's two years now. Uh, no, I think it's uh, three years if it's vintage dated. And a lot of the top houses will especially for their top cuvées, will age for even longer. You have something like uh, a Bollinger RD, which is a late disgorge, will be aged upwards of nine or 10 years on the yeast following the second fermentation. And talking to some of the uh, technical people over in Champagne, say after about 10 years, uh, no more actual uh, gain is made from the autolysis or the breaking down of the grapes. After the second fermentation, after the aging, you now have to get rid of the sediment. So the first step in that is riddling. I'm sure you've all seen riddling racks, these A-frame racks with holes drilled in them. They hold the bottles first at a horizontal position and then you're turning the bottles each day, slowly moving to them, them into the upside down position. So ultimately, the yeast spirals through the bottle, picking up any stray particles, pulling them down to the neck. At that point, the bottles are pretty much in the vertical position. The bottles are then go, well, they're chilled down. And then when they're pulled out of the chiller and you chill them down before disgorging or before re opening them up to remove the sediment, you chill them down because in colder temperatures, you won't lose as much pressure inside the bottles. When the bottles are upside down, the bottles will go into a rack that holds about an inch and a half of the neck in a freezing brine, and it causes a frozen plug to encapsulate the yeast. The bottles are put upright and disgorging. You pry off the temporary cap, the pressure inside blows out the frozen plug of sediment, during the brief time that the wine is open, a dosage goes in. This is a sugar syrup. 
uh, mixed with a little bit of sulfur. Uh, other things can be added to uh, change the flavor. Traditionally, quite often they would use a little bit of brandy. Uh, this is the last chance to actually impact the flavor of the wine. And then the cork goes in. That is the traditional method. <clears throat> this, uh, this is a picture, uh, uh, actually two pictures. The uh, picture on the left shows you uh, the traditional riddling racks. Uh, in many houses that I visited over in the Champagne region, they've switched to the picture on the right, which is a uh, giro palette. It is a riddling machine. It is a bin who holds approximately 500 bottles. And they work by a computer program where the bottles start out in the horizontal position and the whole bin is moved a little bit each day, slowly working its way into the upside down position. And then this is a picture of how much yeast is in the average bottle uh, after the riddling is over. And that is the yeast that is encapsulated when you freeze the wine in the neck of the bottle. And this is a picture of the frozen plug of yeast uh, before the disgorging. Okay, now on to Pet Nat. Uh, Pet Nat preceded the traditional method. And a lot of people think that, you know, uh, for the same reason the champagne was sort of a happy accident that so was the method ancestral. Once again, the quality of grapes is vital. Uh, you start your fermentation, uh, and, but what would happen in, in quite often in France is that the, the fermentation would be arrested before it was complete because the cold air of winter would set in and the cellars would be too cold to continue a fermentation. So the fermentation would stop but there was still sugar left in the wine. Uh, and the wine would be put into bottles, a uh, stopper put in, and then in spring when the weather would warm up, the fermentation would kick on again and ferment the last of the sugar that was left in the bottle, creating bubbles in the wine. Of course, controlling the amount of pressure was difficult because you had no idea how much sugar was left in the wine. More sugar, more pressure. Um, so in the modern pet nat method, uh, in essence, you are fermenting. Ideally, you do real-time tracking of your fermentable sugars. But relying on a hydrometer is always a little dicey. Uh, sometimes wines can be dry at just under like minus one bricks. Sometimes they're not dry till it's minus two bricks. Uh, I have had uh, winemakers forget that zero is not, zero bricks on a hydrometer is not zero sugar. Zero bricks, this probably can still be as much as like 2% sugar or more. And uh, uh, anyway, you put the bottle, where you stop the fermentation, ideally, you chill the wine down, stop the fermentation with the desired amount of sugar left. As I told you before, four grams per liter of sugar will translate into about one atmosphere pressure. The wine, the sugar, and some of the yeast that is still active in the wine go into the bottles. A temporary cap goes over, and then the bottles are brought up well, one of the ways you stop the wine or slow it down so you can bottle it is you chill it down. You then, after you bottle it, put the temporary cap on, you bring the bottles up to uh, a warmer temperature, you finish the fermentation inside the bottle. Uh, at that point, you have pressure. Ideally, you don't have too much pressure. Uh, and uh, clarification, most pet nets are not clarified or if they're clarified, they're clarified minimally, and there's still set of some sediment left in there. Uh, uh, for the most part, I'd say most of the, the pet gnats have uh, no clarification, uh, and so you don't have the need of another closure. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, several caveats here in that because of difficulty in, in stopping the fermentation exactly at the right amount of sugar for the amount of pressure you need, uh, there was one winemaker in the Loire Valley where basically modern pet nat uh, received this sort of resurgence of popularity. Uh, he referred to pet nats as Russian roulette in a bottle. And uh, the other problem is that if you ferment too far before it goes into bottle, then you're going to end up with no pressure. Uh, ideally, you don't, I would not ever try to get as much pressure as I do in a traditional champagne. I would probably go for about three to four atmospheres of pressure. And I have some friends that are doing their pet nats at two atmospheres. So that's pet nat, Charmat method. Once again, uh, grapes. Quality of grapes is going to be a big determinant on the quality of the wine you make using the Charmat method. I was very happy to hear uh, that Josie was, uh, Josie was doing uh, a Charmat method because I've become very taken with it of late. Uh, a friend of mine who is German uh, said that in Germany, they have Charmat producers all over the countryside. And when people have an abundance of grapes, you make the wine you need for your still wine production, and you take the excess over to the Charmat producer that makes it into sparkling for you. Uh, the, uh, it is, this method was in, developed in the early 20th century. And basically, you make your base wine, you add sugar and yeast. So the base wine, the sugar, the yeast go into a pressure rated fermentation tank. It's sealed up, a second fermentation takes place in there. After the second fermentation, filtration is done under pressure into a bottling tank. And the bottling tank, uh, we'll probably just get into this later on during the panel discussion, the bottling tank has to be pressurized ahead of time before the wine goes into it. Otherwise, the wine going into it would just lose all of its pressure. Anyway, uh, it's filtered under pressure into the bottling tank. And then uh, most of the time, it is then sterile filtered into a counter pressure filler and the closure put on. Now, there are variations on this. Uh, one of the variations is uh, like instead of, is created almost like a pet nat, so where you get toward the, end, toward the end of the second fermentation. And when you are at the desired sugar level for the pressure you want, you see, just seal up the tank at that point and let it complete its second fermentation in that tank. So it's, it's, it's not two fermentations. It's just a continuation of the first one. And another, uh, another variation is done by a friend of mine down in uh, uh, Temecula, who makes a very good high-end Charmat Method sparkling wine. And he doesn't use a pump in any of the transferring of his, of his uh, sparkling wines using the Charmat Method. He uses pressure differential. So he will get up to six atmospheres in the in the fermentation tank and in his bottling tank that he's pumping to that he's filtering to he will have that set for five atmospheres so that extra atmosphere pressure will be enough to push the wine from one tank to the other and then he uses pressure differential again to push the wine to the the counter pressure filler that's the charmat method and uh, if you want examples of high-end Charmat wines, well, uh, look at Josie, who will be on our panel, uh, look at in Temecula at South Coast Winery, and uh, Larry Mobby up in uh, Michigan. All are making high-end Charmat wines. You also have uh, the, uh, the, the good high-end Rusco out of Italy, and not, the old Giacobazzi and Rio Need, not that stuff. But, uh, and then you also have uh, Prosecco is the Charmat method. 
Carbonation, the easiest and simplest way to get bubbles in your wine. Any wine can be carbonated. Uh, in this case, uh, you can take your finest, uh, your, your finest wine, like I said, what you'll find is you'll find some very fine Vermentinos along the Ligurian coast in Italy. And in the middle of summer, they will give you, they will offer you a Vermentino that's very slightly effervescent and it's very refreshing. Um, so, and this will probably, I would say, ultimately is the easiest because you don't have to worry about fermentation. You don't have to worry about, you can actually clean up your wine completely at the very beginning. So you, you make your base wine, the wine that you're going to carbonate, you stabilize it, you clean it up, all of that. Now, for the carbonation, you have to do it in a, generally it's done in a bright tank, and slow and cold is the best. Uh, there are ways that agitate it more, but with the higher the agitation, the, the bigger the bubbles, and the shorter live the carbonation will be. Uh, there was a paper actually done by a fellow in uh, uh, California, uh, Justin Miller, it goes back to the late 50s, early 60s. He developed a means of doing carbonation very low, very slow, <clears throat> and uh, he did it by basically putting the wine opened in the bottle into a chamber that was then slowly pressurized. Very gently, uh, the CO2 was, was infused in the wine and then under pressure, the wine was capped. And he claimed to have uh, acquired very small long lasting bubbles as a result because there was less agitation than you get in most carbonation processes. Uh, cold is very important. Uh, I did have one winemaker call me from the Livermore Valley here in California a couple of years ago. He said his his uh, carbonation just was not sticky. No matter how much CO2 he had pumped into the tank, uh, the wine was always relatively flat. Then I found out he was trying to carbonate in the middle of summer at room temperature. Think of a bottle of Coca-Cola. If you open up a very cold bottle of Coca-Cola, you'll get a little <laughs> when you open it and most of the pressure stays in the bottle. Open up a warm bottle of Coca-Cola or room temperature bottle of Coca-Cola and it sprays all over the place and is flat in no time at all. Anyway, after the wine is carbonated, it's bottled through a counter pressure filler and then the uh, closure is put on. Now, I'm going to go over briefly the pros and cons of the, the four different methods. Uh, pros on the traditional method. Pros is you do have the highest perceived quality. And, you, and in many cases, you do have the most complexity because it does spend the time aging on the yeast. And that yeast puts a lot of complexity a lot of mouthfeel in the wine. Uh, the, uh, now this can also be done in the Charmat method too. Uh, and uh, in the Charmat method, uh, once again, the, with the high-end stuff produced at the friend of mine's place down in Temecula, he holds it 18 months on the yeast in the tank, every couple of months, giving it a quick spin of a gooth mixer, <coughs> excuse me, to mix up the sediment with the wine. Um, you have quite often the smallest, most persistent bubbles with the traditional method. That's because you you have in you have the mo uh, the most in many cases you have the most amount of protein, and protein is vital in maintaining your bubble quality. Uh, uh, and if you look at traditional champagne. When I was over in the Champagne region, no Champagne maker even admitted to doing any bentonite fining uh, because bentonite removes protein. Uh, when I checked with some of the technical people there, they said that maybe there's 2% that 
uh, of the producers have some protein instability, but that's a very small amount and people will prefer to take that chance rather than take the chance that they're gonna end up with big short-lived bubbles. So, uh, so maintaining the protein uh, through the, uh, not removing the grape protein and then also getting protein produced by the breakdown of the yeast after the second fermentation. Also in the traditional method, you can, uh, you can produce at a small level. You can produce sparkling wine with very little specialized equipment, except maybe the crown capper. You can do the rest by hand. And uh, Andy can speak to that uh, during our panel meeting. Uh, the cons, it is the most labor intensive and the longest method. Uh, it is, ex once you decide to go beyond a very small level, if you want to expand, uh, some of the specialized equipment, such as disgorging equipment, can be expensive. And then dangerous, yes. You're handling bottles under high pressure, under at least six atmospheres of pressure. And, and, and all you need is a scratch on the bottle or just a weakness somewhere, and that bottle can explode. So you have to be very careful. Uh, Wear something around your neck if you're hand, when you're handling the bottles, and ideally wear a mat, wear a shield over your face. Uh, pros and cons of pet nat. The pros. Uh, see, I find pet nat to be exciting just because you never know what you're going to get. It captures the the young, fresh, fruity fermentation aromas. I th I think of all of the times that. I've tasted a young wine that is at the tail end of fermentation and is bright and it's crisp and these fermentation esters and aromas and the bubbles that are on the palate. And you're like, God, if only I could put that in a bottle. And that's what Pet Nat does. It's quick to market. It's inexpensive to produce. No specialized equipment is needed except a crown capper. Uh, and I'm putting here as a pro, it tends to be inconsistent. That is the selling point that so many of the producers use. It's like, you can always buy a Cabernet and know what you're gonna expect. You can buy a Chardonnay and know what to expect. With, with Pet Nat, it's always exciting. It always changes. It's the element of surprise. The, cloud, the cons, it is generally cloudy. It is inconsistent. So the very thing that can be an element of surprise if spun in the, in the right mode, uh, the, uh, if, if, it's not, if the consumer is not properly educated to it, uh, that the inconsistency can be a negative. Uh, in that inconsistency, it might be flat or it might have too much carbonation. And I saw this with one winemaker who uh, uh, he had too much carbonation. The bottles did not explode. And so long as the wine was in the cellar where it was kept nice and cold, everything was fine. But when they moved it into the tasting room and it went up to room temperature, all of the bottles started spewing around the crown caps. Uh, and there might be problems with reduction because of excessive lees. Uh, ideally, in making pet nat, uh, you can chill the wines down, cold crash them when you have just the right amount of sugar. Most of your heavy sediment is going to settle down. You can rack off that, and you end up with just enough yeast when you bottle that it, it finishes the fermentation. Uh, if you have, but I saw producers when I was uh, uh, traveling around the country that did not have the means of, of tracking it that way, did not have the means of chilling the tank down sufficiently, and they ended up with two to three inches of sediment in the neck of the bottle. And there you can have a problem with sort of reduced sulfur characteristics in the coming from the nose. And then also because of the sediment, you can also, and sediment and a lot of pressure can cause it to gush. Charmat, 
Here you have prose. It is faster than the traditional method. With a mixer, it can be lees aged. Uh, you're going to end up with more fruit driven flavors. So especially with, with hybrid grapes, which the one of the, for me, so much of the charm and so many of the hybrid grapes are these incredible fruit characteristics. And the Charmat method is a wonderful way to, to maintain those flavors and aromas. Uh, once the equipment is acquired and it, uh, it very low labor cost. Now the cons, the initial investment in pressure rated tanks, pumps, filters, everything pressure rated, the initial expense is quite a bit. Uh, one of the things you're fighting against in the general market is because of things like, uh, oh, I don't know, famous French champagnes like Andre and uh, Jacques Bonnet. Uh, there's this image of Charmat as producing only poor quality. But as I mentioned, there, if you go over to Europe, you'll see some very high quality sparkling wines made using this method, including Prosecco and some of the high end, uh, like the Lambrusco Grasparoso out of uh, uh, the area around Modena and uh, Emilia Romagna. Uh, generally, the bubbles will be depending on how it's treated. Uh, if you don't over fine the base wine, if you don't over fine the base wine, uh, you're going to end up uh, uh, with some, pre you can have some pretty good bubbles, but generally the bubbles are a little bit bigger, a little bit shorter lasting than traditional method. Then finally, carbonation, pros, it's fast and easy. Cons, bigger, shorter lived bubbles. You get no added complexity from a yeast after the second fermentation. Uh, and then the expense of bright tanks and counter pressure fillers, et cetera. So I will close this off. This is a picture I took on a wall in the middle of the Champagne region in the town of Aubier. It's called uh, the prayer, the morning prayer, uh, la prière du matin. Says, donnez-moi la santé pour longtemps, le boulot pas trop souvent, de l'amour de temps en temps, mais du champagne tout le temps means give me health for a long time, work not too often, love from time to time, but champagne always. And on that note, thank you, Drew. Thank you, Ode, and thank you, everybody else. Thanks, Michael. That's a good ending note. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah. for your great presentation. That was really good to have a real overview of every every technique. Um, but I went 31 minutes, I'm sorry. That's okay, that's okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, so thanks for all that great presentation. So now it's the time for you to put any question you have in the either the Q&A box or the chat box. I already see that we have two questions. Um, and so we are with different winemakers who hopefully will help for that discussion. Yes, indeed. Uh, we're ready for the panel discussion. Uh, as Ode mentioned earlier, we'll be joined by, uh, and raise your hand when I mention your name, uh, Andrew Andy Morse from Breezy Hills Vineyard in Iowa. Uh, Christy Walker uh, from uh, Walker Homestead Farm and Vineyard in Iowa, along with uh, uh, Kent. Kurt, did I get you? Kent. Uh, Kent. Kent, sorry, sorry, okay. Kent. Uh, and, uh, and Josie Boyle uh, from Moose Sparkling Wine Company in Jordan, Minnesota. Uh, we are fortunate indeed uh, today to have so many experienced winemakers here to discuss the subject of sparkling, of sparkling winemaking. And I'll just add uh, that uh, uh, in most of these cases, uh, these are uh, smaller, uh, newer producers who have uh, uh, really built their own uh, sellers and have acquired their own equipment and their own knowledge and experience, uh, especially in the use of uh, our, our, our Midwestern uh, uh, interspecific hybrid grapes. And uh, so any of you uh, folks out there listening, 
you've got an incredible opportunity here to get some really practical nuts and bolts knowledge uh, on how to start your own uh, sparkling wine program. Uh, Ode, you said we've got a couple questions. Yeah, and it's coming. I'm very happy to see all those questions. Uh, so the first question is uh, from Maudik. Uh, in Charmat Method, you mentioned, Michael, that it's necessary to push the wine from second fermentation tank into a bottling tank. So why is that? And could the wine be bottled straight from the fermentation tank using a counter pressure filter? Uh, it it would be uh, difficult because what uh, the way you add your uh, dosage is you put it in to the bottling tank. Uh, well, be before you before you seal up that tank, so you can add your dosage to the bottling tank. And then when you filter into the bottling tank, the dosage mixes with the wine. Uh, now, I'm sure that there are ways, and I, I think I've heard of some systems in Germany where they have inline uh, dosage additions. I have not seen any of that in the United States. And that would that would require some very fine tuning and probably some very expensive equipment. But if you try uh, now, if you're not doing a if you're not adding any dosage in the Charmat method, then conceivably you could do it. Uh, Josie, you can you can ask talk to this too. If you're making it bone dry, then I see no reason why you couldn't go through from your second fermentation directly through your primary filter, which acts as a pre-filter through a sterile filter into your uh, uh, counter pressure filler. Okay. Yeah, the only the only thing I would think of is um, just making sure your sulfur levels and at bottling are correct. So I, again, it's, if you're, I don't know, um, I've always just filtered right into a bottling tank um, because even if you don't want to sweeten the wine, you still want to um, have some level of sulfur in the bottle um, after bottling. So I don't know how you I, I don't know how you do it otherwise. Yeah, it would have, once again it have to be metered in, which would be an expensive uh, proposition. Right. Okay. Yep. But it is one of the reasons why. I, have, I can't tell you how many winemakers I've had approach me saying, I have a pressure rated tank. I'm going to do the Charmat method, but they only have one tank. Mm -hmm. You need two tanks because you always need a tank to go into. Uh, if you have 10 tanks, you still need, you know, if you, let's say you have, let's say you have 10 tanks that are full, you still need one tank empty. You always need one tank empty so you can go into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, there is another question related to pet net. So should wine, this, uh, like for pet net, be cold stabilized and heat stabilized? Yeah, I, I'm gonna just jump in really quick and say, I was also interested in, in this detail from, from Michael's presentation. Uh, 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 you could answer this question about pet nat first about whether they, that wine should be cold and or heat or bentonite or protein stabilized. Uh, but uh, uh, I'd like you to sort of hit the high points again about the uh, traditional method and and not using bentonite on the uh, on the base wine. Very interested to hear about that. Okay, so first the uh, thing with the pet nat and uh, Josie, you're making pet nat too. I, I think you said. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no, heat and cold stable in, 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 a, in a, a regular pet net, you don't worry about that because as I talked to a friend of mine who uh, uh, does pet net up in, uh, uh, up in the Finger Lakes, and I, I just gave her a, a quick call and saying, uh, you know, do you, what do you do? To protein, do you or do you protein stabilize your pet net? And and she just her tongue in cheek, she just answered, "Dude, it's pet net. It's cloudy. 
it's fun and there's all sorts of things going on in there and it's always changing you don't do those things you don't cold stabilize and because you would have to cold stabilize at the juice stage and that's not cold stabilization mm -hmm. uh, you could possibly uh chill down the bottles after this when the second fermentation is complete and do a modified disgorging but then you start losing all of the advantage of having a pet nat which is the excitement and the gunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andy, Kent, Christy, do you make pet nut? Don't. No. No? I do not. Okay. Okay. Uh, after, after, this, after this discussion, do, do any of you plan to try making a pet nut? I, I think it would be fun to do a small batch to, yeah, we're, we're going to experiment with it. I think it would be great. Yeah, we're we're full body armor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, uh, before I forget, I'm going to jump in again right now. I, I don't know if you see it, but I I I, uh, I don't know. I won't hold that up for too long. Uh, I got five stitches in my thumb uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I was uh, 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 crown capping, uh, manually crown capping uh, some research wine, and as 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 Michael uh, mentioned, the the bottle had some sort of weakness or a scratch on it, and the darn thing. I'm holding it with my left and I'm capping with the right and it exploded in my left hand, shattered and drove a huge piece of glass right through the uh, the meat of my thumb. And uh, I instantly decided that uh, uh, moving forward, uh, I was going to wear a, a heavy leather glove on my capping hand and, uh, and uh, of course, always wear eye protection. Uh, and I've seen people are doing a lot of wine bottling right now and they're happy on social media to to show the crew working and very rarely do I see anybody wearing any eye protection. And uh, even if your bottling line has clear doors to close and such, take it from me, uh, wear your eye protection uh, and hand protection in any type of bottling operations. Uh, was this a sparkling wine, Drew? <laughs> no, 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 I, I, uh, I bottle small batches of my research wine in okay. beer bottles. I, I, I'm uh, this, impressed. This was a 16 ounce. Yeah. That you Your were able bottle, to explode just, a bottle of non-sparkling wine. <laughs> just for my little research batches, where I maybe have three or four bottles uh, of a wine, I'll just put it in beer bottles because I don't want to mess with corks. Yeah. Okay. And to your I, point, about, oh, go ahead, Josie. Oh, I I did want to just mention I do encourage people to try making pet nat. Um, we opened in tw well. Our, I guess our second harvest was in 2020 and I made like a little tiny bit of pet nat. I did 10 cases um, just off one of our fermentation tanks that was tasting really nice. Um, and I, you know, I put it into heavyweight sparkling bottles with a crown cap and uh, people loved it. So last year we did, um, we actually did two different lots. We did a white and a rosé. And we did about 25 or 30 cases of each of those. And uh, people are just loving them. We're almost, we sold out of the white and we're almost out of the rose now. So, um, oh, did, you, did you price it less than the sparkling? No, more actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's something new. And depending on where you are, it's something that most people, yeah will not have heard of or won't have tried before um, if you're in more like rural outside of city areas. So for us, um, uh, most of our customers, it's kind of like their first pet nat they've ever tried, but ours turned out really nice. And as long as, it, as it's a nice clean fermentation and, and the wine tastes good going into the bottle, um, obviously you don't want to have any issues with the fermentation, but, um, but yeah, I, we, we've had a good luck and, and, uh, we're going to make even more this year. So. Cool. That's good. And it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of equipment, um, to do it. So. Yeah. That's my, my two cents. <laughs> so now we have like few questions about traditional methods um so i will combine them 
but three questions. So the first one is, would you still pick early the grapes, uh, hybrid grapes for the traditional method because they tend to be very acidic uh, if you harvest early? Uh, so do you keep that high acid grapes? Do you harvest them early to make the uh, sparkling wine following traditional method? And then do you do, what are the pro and the cons of malolactic fermentation of base wine? And another question is, um, there are so many way to sweeten sparkling wine, I think. So how do you decide how much dosage to add and what type to use? So I have three questions just for the traditional method. <laughs> Who wants you want to, to take... start answering? Josie, you want to start? Or Andrew, Andy, if you have any? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, for At least for the hybrid grape question. Uh, on, on that end, when I, uh, at Cedar Ridge, I always made, uh, I had four grape varietals that I used to make our sparkling. Um, and, and it did pretty well. I think we got the Dick Peterson Award uh, three years uh, with it. And it, I picked, the Brianna, and I picked that pretty early where I can get that tropical note um, with uh, heavy uh, pineapple notes to it. Um, and then um, some lacrosse and lacrescent because I wanted that acidity. Um, and we, I did not go through malolactic fermentation. Um, I kind of wanted that acidity, but um, only because I really wanted the aromatics. And, and, and one of the aromatics that I really thought was like this little sleeper grape that was perfect for sparkling was Elvira. Um, which is a really late season uh, ripener. And I knew I was never gonna get it. So I always knew that it had to be super acidic. And um, I would always pick that, that was my blend. And, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, say uh, Chardonnay uh, from Champagne, you know, it's not 100% vintage very often. It's usually blended from previous years to create this blended Chardonnay. Um, I don't have vintages and vintages of uh, La Crescent. So, you know, we kind of have to use a combination of our hybrids to create the flavor profile that we want. Um, and, and I always thought that I like to go a little higher on the acid, even knowing, and, and Mike, you could prove me wrong, but there is a, a touch higher with carbonic acid um, after the um, you know, we get the bubbles in the bottle um, that you also have to have in your mind as well. So you kind of aim a little bit lower on, on that acidity balance that you're looking for. But I think it works really well for um, your aromatics. Um, but like I said, your choice in what hybrids you use is the biggest factor on what flavor profile you're looking for. Do you want it tropical? Do you want it to be more subdued and, and almost chewy or doughy? You know, the, the method through the traditional uh, style there, that what type of hybrid grapes you use is going to be not necessarily how early you pick, but what flavor profile and aromatics you want and how you get those aromatics through acidity. So that, mm -hmm. that makes any sense. That's that's choose how I typically uh, make our, our sparkling. Yeah. Good. Uh, Josie, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, so I, it's, a, it's the, the, the answer is it's a balance, I feel like. Um, I mainly use the U of M varieties for our sparkling wines. So they do tend, the bricks does tend to rise pretty quickly before the acid drops, you know, before you, you get like lower acids. Um, but I don't, personally, I don't, um, worry about super high acids as much as I do about high bricks. Um, I do tend, I usually do water down the juice a little bit, um, be, just because the bricks tends to get a little bit higher than I, I want it to be um, at the beginning. So I'm, I'm not afraid to add a little bit of water just to dilute um, the sugar a little bit at the beginning. Um, what bricks do you like to focus at? Um, but I, I generally, I try to pick bet between 20 and 21 bricks 
sometimes the Marquette um, will get to be, you know, between 21 and 22 um, pretty quickly and, you know, even the front greet. But um, yeah, I, I try to target that and I don't worry about the acid quite as much because there's things you can do in the cellar to reduce the acid later. Yeah. But there's not as much as you can that you can do to reduce the bricks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andy, do you make so we don't see you? We can just see your name. Yeah, I'm but, uh, holding off on my video because it seems to be slowing down my connection. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. So do you have anything to add to that? Um mainly focused on our rose, our sparkling rose. We use 100 percent front neck and we pick that usually around 19 bricks and I mean, the pH coming in is right around three. So we tend to carry quite a bit of acidity with the sparkling rosé. And I think that that helps bring out the more, I guess, tart fruit notes that we want to have in that rosé. Yeah. Otherwise we use in our, in our cuvee, we use catawba and that naturally carries Quite a bit of acidity too, so that you know mm -hmm. do you, helps balance everything out. Do any of you take your your wines through mal? I can't ever say it. Malotic, um fermentation. If you're going to make it into sparkling. No, I don't. Actually, do I you? can answer that I, to that no. because. I do my a uh, little bit of my own experimentally out here and I put mine through malolactic, but that's because it is small batches and I'm doing it experimentally. I don't have the means of doing a sterile filtration or stabilizing it. So I'm doing it for, for two reasons. I have picked the grapes at very low bricks. So my acid's very high. So it's a natural way of bringing the acid down a little bit, but primarily because it gives me uh, microbial stability. But if you're going to do malolactic, I would suggest not doing a sequential inoculation. Do a co-inoculation where you uh, hit it with the bacteria about 24 hours after you hit the primary, you know, on the after the you start the fermentation, about 24 hours after you add the yeast for the primary fermentation. Uh, the advantage of doing this is you're going to have much less chance of having a struggling fermentation like quite often occurs with sequential inoculation and uh, in the uh, the yeast itself consumes diacetyl that buttery character and uh, so it maintains the fresh fruit characteristics if you can uh, uh, co, -inoc co inoculate like that so i use uh, I, I use it, as I say, both as a, a, a means of doing a, a little bit of deacidification and making the wine microbially stable at the same time, but I always do co-inoculation. So is there any specific yan requirements or yeast selection for um, alcoholic fermentation for the traditional uh, method? What specific yeast do you use? Uh, any for, for the, and the, any specific yan requirements that's a yeah, question for the, we have. For, the, for the first fermentation or for the second fermentation um i think for the buttock fermentation so second fermentation okay yeah gen, the sort of the generally accepted amount is a yan of about 100 parts per million uh and for the second fermentation i personally always just use uh uh a, a very strong Bionis strain. I'm either using something like EC1118 or uh, DV10, uh, usually a, a champagne derived uh, yeast that's used to those conditions. Okay. Basically, a bulletproof yeast. You're not going to get a lot of character and flavor during the actual fermentation uh, for, because that's such a sh it's basically such a short fermentation, the second one. So, so you use the encapsulated yeast. The, the encapsulated well, yeast is a uh, that's another Bayana strain. It's a, a QA23, also very strong. That's what we use. 
Yeah. Since you brought it up, Christy, uh, we had a, a, a little bit of a discussion earlier about the pros and cons of encapsulated yeast versus granular yeast. Would you? Would any of you? Andrew had some comments uh, on that along that line as well. We only use encapsulated yeast, so I don't know what the the cons would be. Um, I mean, I don't know the advantages of using another way. Yeah, uh, it, every, every there is no magic bullet. Uh, you have, you know, for second fermentation, you can either do a buildup culture with loose yeast, or you can do encapsulated yeast. Uh, if you use encapsulated yeast, you're you have to be much more careful about the parameters for your baseline because it's a, it's a, the encapsulated yeast is more delicate it's in a more delicate state uh, uh, you have a lot more wiggle room with loose yeast because you're building up a really large population that's very strong and it's not sequestered inside these beads so uh, i've uh, i have with loose yeast i've fermented higher alcohol wines, I've fermented, uh, uh, I've done second fermentations with all sorts of base wines. You're much more limited for, by the parameters that the producers give you for the, the beads. <clears throat> so uh, it saves you because you don't have to do riddling and you don't have to do a buildup culture, but you have to be more careful in your production of your base wine. Personally, and so I, sorry. What? No, go ahead. I have a question for you after. Oh, I was, I was, I was just going to say. Personally, when I'm doing my own, uh, I, I actually like doing the build-up culture. I like seeing how vigorous it gets. So I do a build-up culture on mine, and then I curse myself afterwards when I have to do the riddling. <laughs> but, uh, and but. Uh, the, I do not mind doing the buildup culture, and I and I I always feel good when I see that very vigorous culture going to work, and I and I know that there's a like seventy million cells per mill, and I feel I feel happy. <laughs> it, going back just to our to finish off the malolactic fermentation discussion. Yeah. Last year we did take our wines through that, and the year two years before we did not, and I I feel like that our sparklings were better, uh, more crisp without it. It could have just been our process, but go going forward, we won't. What, <laughs> and I, I will discuss it, but <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I, I thought they were, we're selling them out. Nobody's complaining, but I yeah. personally enjoy them more without it. Yeah, no, the, uh, if I were doing it, if I had a, 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 a full scale winery here and I were doing this commercially, especially where I am, where we acid is at a premium, I would probably not do a malolactic because I will also would have the means of doing a sterile filtration, which I don't do, which I don't have here. You don't want your wine to undergo malolactic in the bottle. Uh, I, I've never seen it happen with traditional method, but I have seen it happen with the Charmat method where uh, they did not do a sterile filtration and the wine underwent a malolactic in the bottle. Uh, the uh, personally, I, I, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys out there because you, I'm an acid freak. I like champagne base wine mm -hmm. and, you know, basically give me a dozen oysters and, and a bottle of champagne base wine and I'm happy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Not many people share my love of that acid. Uh, the uh, the the Frontenac that Andy More uses. Oyster. Oh, yeah. yeah. The 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 uh, Frontenac that Andy uses is like, I love the Frontenac based uh, rose bubblies. And uh, I, I remember tasting the very first one that you guys made uh, at Breezy Hills. The uh, God, that was nice. And, it was fun. Uh, we got a little more color out of it this year, so it's going to be a little darker than a rosé, but yeah. it'll still have that acid to it. Oh, yeah. And quite often with something like that, uh, it's the, your pH is so low that you're, uh, it quite often, 
um, protects you against undergoing malolactic in the bottle anyway. Yeah. Oh, and, and speaking of malolactic, I was just going to tell Christy, uh, you don't need to say malolactic, just say secondary fermentation. <laughs> Well, then I always think of secondary fermentation as what oh, we put the encapsulation like in the okay, bottle. Yeah, great. So, no, yeah, I, I will always struggle with that word. Right. MF. I can say <laughs> MF. MF. That's it. ML. Yes, to say <laughs> ML. ML. Yeah. ML. That's what. Um, I, I've seen a few more questions here. I'm going to go ahead and jump in, Ode, and, and ask one of them. Uh, uh, there's a question about uh, using uh, screw caps for sparkling wine. Uh, I don't think for traditional method, but uh, are there are there screw caps, uh, Michael, that can that can tolerate six atmospheres or above? Uh, yeah, there. Well, I don't know about six atmospheres. Uh, I I remember a few years ago. I I think it might have been Stelvin. I think they came out with a cap for sparkling wine, but I don't know what what pressure it will take. You know, Josie. Um. Yeah, I recall they do have something, but I think it's probably only about two volumes or something. Like it's not high, yeah. but I can't remember either. So my, there's also, my, I think Zork uh, has a uh, sparkling wine uh, stopper too. But a lot of these are are also very are, are short lived. They're they're not meant for any kind of a, a long aging. And a follow up question really quick, uh, Michael, you mentioned in your talk about a specialized uh, crown cap crown cap for for either for sparkling wines or maybe it was just for tirage. Uh, can you what, what makes the crown cap special? Uh, well, uh, as opposed to uh, a beer cap, I, I know we uh, we represented a crown caps uh, company for a couple of years and they had. Crown cap specifically for sparkling wine. Uh, now, the, th the different as opposed to beer, uh, for instance, sparkling wine has lower pH, higher alcohol, and a lot more pressure than beer, and a lot more pressure than beer or soda pop. Uh, so it has to be strong enough to maintain to hold that pressure in. Uh, and insofar as the chemical makeup of the crown cap, I'm not sure, but. It would strike me that it would behoove them to have metal being used that is more resistant to the high acid. And I know there have been issues with some crown caps, especially made from standard steel with rusting when like a bottle above them was leaking and the wine came down on the crown cap below them and caused that crown cap to, to rust. But so, what is the maximum atmosphere of most sparkling wines? Do we know? Uh, Jim, I Six. would say after disgorging, you're probably down around five atmospheres of pressure. That's under standard okay. conditions. Uh, the uh, the the usually goes from about I guess nine and a half to eleven grams per uh, per liter of mm -hmm. CO two. Okay. Good. Uh, I do have a, a question about the foam because you mentioned the foam. That's really a, a quality of sparkling wines, right? And it's coming both from grapes and from the yeast. So do you use specific yeast? And that's a question for all of you. Do you use a specific yeast for to have enough foam? Or do you and also do you use oh, did you observe that depending on the grape variety that is used, the hybrid varieties tend to have a little bit more proteins uh, than Vitis vinifera varieties? So did you observe in the past a difference of foam based on the varieties that was used? Does, that, does my question make sense? <laughs> so two questions about the yeast <laughs> and the variety. <laughs> okay, well, as far as the yeast are concerned, uh, no, I don't, you know, you're looking for a, a yeast where the second fermentation is just going to be bulletproof and carry out the second fermentation. Uh, the, and it's the autolysis, the breakdown of that, that is going to give you the proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I don't, I haven't 
I don't know that anybody's done any study as to which yeast and breaking down puts the most protein into the wine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I know uh, some aspects of it, the, uh, for instance, in the aging, uh, it's generally said that you want at least nine months aging on the yeast. And that, that will help with the, like with the removal of the yeast because it's much harder to riddle before that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you have an aging less time on the yeast. The, um, so far as the protein level, well, protein, basically protein works with the CO2. They, they tend to uh, cling to each other. Uh, actually, uh, Andy, I think, yeah, you were there, the seminar where uh, Belinda Kemp and I spoke at the Iowa show. Uh, this goes God, about eight years ago now. Uh, and she showed. I can barely remember was, last year, let alone eight years ago. Oh, <laughs> so young and so few brain cells. Uh, right. It's all that sparkling wine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, oh, you better make it worthwhile. Uh, but uh, she was saying it's it's almost like uh, a micelle, which is basically what it's it's how uh, like for instance, it works when you are with detergent. Uh, you have this uh, bubble and it has a charge on it and it attracts the positive charges of the protein around it. And so the protein t tends to stabilize the bubbles and the bubbles stabilize the protein. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, so just to be, just to be clear, we're, we're talking about for, for making a base wine for traditional method does not need to be bentonite stabilized. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the thing is, with a lot, there are some hybrids, and especially the, uh, the ones out of uh, uh, University of Minnesota, tend to be higher in protein. Uh, I, I was talking to Mark Wenzel down at Illinois Sparkling Company about this, and he's using only hybrids. And he said, Certain ones, like the the ones out of Minnesota, tend to be uh, uh, the highest in protein. And he, I am, I think he intimated that he does a minor uh, 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 protein or uh, bentonite treatment with them. Uh, some of them, like some of the more traditional ones, like uh, Marshall Foch, tend to be much lower. Uh, so. A lot of it comes from, it changes depending on what variety, it changes on where it's grown. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you look at the champagne varieties, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, Chardonnay, uh, hardly anybody and nobody that I've talked to in champagne protein stabilizes. The same producers that are over there <clears throat> are not doing any protein stabilization. Some of them have operations here in California they've planted the same varieties and they have to do a modified protein stabilization <clears throat> because the grapes get a little riper, they're a little higher in protein, the mm -hmm. change in climate, the change in soil, all of these things affects the protein level. Yeah. And so I that's so what I ask, like, did you observe any differences in terms of foam depending on the varieties that were used? Christy, did you observe any anything? I did not observe differences on the foam. Okay. But I, I I'm curious the amount of about the resting the wines for nine months on the second fermentation yeah. in the bottle. I we um don't do that for all of us. It's when we get, because we're small and we do everything by hand. It's right. like when we get to it. I'm curious if other people wait nine months, because we don't wait that long before we start using uh, it. I'd say, well, well, it depends. I mean, if you're talking about the big guys, like the Domaine Chandons, the Mums, the, yeah, they'll they'll quite often be, like for their regular brutes, uh, age it, uh, usually anywhere from 12 to 24 months. <clears throat> then you have their special cuvées that they might age uh, longer. I remember Domaine Chandon would age their top of the line for six years. 
uh, Gloria Ferrer, who had aged it for 10 years, nine or 10 years. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the other hand, you have some other producers that they, they want to maintain more fruit. And they're also looking at the bottom line and they are, they're aging for maybe five or six months. Yeah. And they have had, in some cases, they have had, the, the primary thing is the issue with the ease of riddling and disgorging. Um, so they've dealt, and they deal with that with by changing their riddling program on the machines or by adding a, maybe more of the adjuvant that helps the, the yeast glom together. Uh, in, in your case, well, if you're using the beads, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. If you're not riddling it. Yeah, so. I mean, our, ours tends to spend, usually spends the summer on the yeast and we, we disgorge it and bottle it uh, or finish it the, the following winter uh, when we've got yeah. some nice cold weather outside. But that is how thirsty we are. We may have to do it after three months. Yeah, it's not necessarily by design, more so just when we get to it and when we have time and we can't do it in the summertime, so. Yeah, uh, the logistics is important. Uh, style, what, what style of wine you're trying to make is important. Uh, and we, yeah, we do like to have that little bit of aging time versus, yeah. you know, trying to push it out real quick. So usually letting it set over the summer is is our best option versus rushing it and trying to get it finished right away in that same yeah. bottling season. And I remember at the seminar we did where Belinda was there, the uh, we tasted afterwards, I believe we tasted your uh, uh, Frontenac and we tasted uh, Mark Wenzel's Frontenac. And his tended to be brighter, fresher, more fruit driven. And yours had a lot more of that almost traditional complexity to it. Yep. Right, thank you. Uh, I have a question um, about sterile filter. Can you explain how best to sterilize filter into a counter pressure filler? We find that the cartridge agitates the bubbles too much during filling, causing excessive foam. That's a question from Anne. I think. Oh. Uh, uh, for that, I would probably actually have you get in touch with our filtration guru. Her name is Maria Peterson. Uh, and uh, she pretty much answers a lot of the actually hands on direct questions about these things. Uh, she can be reached at Maria P at scottlab.com. But generally, the, a lot of the, the aspects of gushing that I've seen in some Charmat places has to do with uh, not only pressure differential, but temperature differential. Uh, if you are, you have to make sure, oh, well. It, it helps if the if all of the if the room, the equipment, the filler, all of that are all chilled down so that when the wine hits it, it's it won't cause a, a temperature spike in the wine and cause the release of uh, pressure. Or you'll see, at higher temperatures, you'll lose solubility of your CO2. And uh, we, we saw this one place where they were doing canned effervescent uh, wine and they were losing a lot, but turned out they didn't have a place to store the cans in the winery. And so they were outside in the sun, bringing the cans in. And so the wine was hitting it and it was gushing like crazy. But other than that, uh, some of the other, uh, if, if, if it continues gushing, then, uh, I would I would talk to uh, Maria about the filtration side of it. Good. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Um, so I just sent the link to the previous recording. Um, it's not related directly, but anyway, uh, we have other questions about pet nut. So we are going back to pet nut. Uh, at what sugar level do you put um, pet nut in the butter? And what pressure do you shoot for in pet nuts? So two questions for pet, pet nuts. Thank you, Josie. Yeah, Josie. Josie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I, well, I was told and it has worked for me is, um, to bottle when the wine is under one bricks on the hydrometer. So it, as long as it's under one, um, you should be okay. That should be like, like enough, like, um, enough sugar has been consumed in the fermentation so that the, you know, it, the rest of the fermentation in the bottle doesn't get too high. Um, I, and of course it depends on the starting bricks of the wine and everything, but, um, but anyway, I, I, under one bricks is, is a pretty good, um, I guess I've heard that from a few different sources. So I think that's kind of a, a stand standard, um, uh, metric for pet nat. Um, Josie, are you are, just to be totally clear with these these newer winemakers? Are you using your plus five minus five hydrometer? Yes. So for anybody out there who does not own a plus five minus five bricks hydrometer, go to piwine.com and get yourself one. And make sure you're like paying attention to the to the temperature of your wine too and doing temperature correction when you're reading your hydrometer because that can make a huge difference if your wine is warm or cold um and so what i do is you know i i obviously have the wine in a tank that has temperature control um so as it approaches that one bricks level I chill it down. I chill the, you know, start to chill the, the wine down to about 35 degrees, 35, 40 degrees for a couple days to kind of slowly stop that or at least slow down the fermentation um, before bottling. And then I, um, that helps a little bit to drop some of that sediment out too. Um, but that's really just to like slow down the fermentation enough so that you don't blow past your, the point that you're aiming for, um, either. So, yeah. Christy, do you do the same thing for pet net? Um, we, we don't do pet net. We do a pet cat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought, you, yeah. <laughs> we do a paquette, which we didn't talk about today, is True. one more style, but we don't do the pet net. Okay. All right. We could talk about paquette if we have time after answering all those questions. I think we are almost done with the questions. Let me check. Sugar, there was somebody was asking about sugar dosing with sugar. Uh, there are some questions on that. Okay. Oh, what type of sugar, maybe? At what? At what sugar levels do you put in the bottles? There's a couple of them like that. How do you know? Let's see. Yeah. How do you, yeah, how do you add, how do you decide how much dosage to add and what type do you use? Josie, uh, maybe, or any one of you. So we do a brute and we just uh, um, tap off the bottles. We do not, um, we don't sugar up anything at Walker Homestead. And Josie, how do you decide how much dosage to do? Uh, I assume this meat, this is for a traditional method, right? Yeah, I, yeah, for sure, Matt. I just do, you know, um, just I do it by taste most mostly. You know, I just I have a range that I'm shooting for, okay. and of course, in champagne, um, there's traditional like. Brut, you know, extra brut, um, uh, you know, extra, sex, dry. extra dry. All of those have like certain sugar levels that you're you're finishing the wine with. So if you kind of start there, um, I just I just literally start at the beginning of disgorgement when I'm disgorging a new lot, and just doing a few bottles and seeing what I like, and then going from there. Um, same with with Charmat. If I, you know, in the in the tank, I I pull a sample and I do a couple of mixtures and figure out what what sugar level I like. And and once you figure that out, 
once once you figure that out, that you then measure your bottling tank. Let's say you've decided, hey, I'm going to do seven grams of sugar per liter. Yeah. And now I've got this volume, and it's 716 liters. Okay, well, you do the math, and you add yep. that much. Uh, do you use do you use dry sucrose, dry sugar? Yep, I just use um, regular sugar from from the grocery store mostly, um, yep. and I mix it either with wine. I've also done water, just a water sugar sulfur mix or wine sugar sulfur. Um, but yeah. Cool. Has anyone ever used uh, glycerin um, in a part of their dosage to either find balance, maybe not add uh, cane sugar or any source along those lines, but has anyone ever tried yeah. using glycerin? You mean glycerol? Glycerol, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, glycerol. I've heard of it being done, but I haven't personally tried it. I only know one person using glycerin or glycerol around here, and it's Andy Karaski, and he uses it just in his still wine. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as Josie. We do a like a we do a water and sugar like a simple syrup dosage to add at the end, and kind of the same way like a, a tasting trial at the beginning of our lot. Do a couple sample bottles, or however we want to do it to to see where where we want to sweeten it within the the parameters of the label, you know, I think, I think we're demi sec on our cuvee. So we've got a little bit higher sugar range that we can work with to, to sweeten it a little more. Sure. I just yeah. wasn't sure if uh, glycerol would affect, um, you know, if you're just trying to knock off the edge, if maybe we just went a little too far on uh, the acid and uh, instead of adding sugar, uh, if, if anybody's ever used that glycerol just to, if it affected bubbles or if it affected any other type of methods, but I think you would also have to look at the legalities because uh, it's the the government is very strict about what things you can add, uh, and I have I don't know if you can add legally add glycerol. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the question we had. Is it even allowed by the TTB as an additive? Yeah. Oh yeah, because. Uh, and sometimes they will allow you to add things, but then you have to label, put it on your label that as a, uh, with the description of what you've added it because you're now a non standard one. Yeah. Is anyone here making piquette? Let's move on piquette. Not yet. Uh, you know what, uh, Christy, uh, let me just ask one more question of Mike. We've got one more written question from Mark Wedge at Dancing Dragonfly. Uh, he says he's heard of a U.S. traditional uh, champ traditional style champagne maker using cork at Tirage instead of a crown cap. Uh, have you heard of this? Do you know who he's talking about? Oh, God, I don't, I don't know who uh, is doing that in the U.S. Uh, I, I know several producers that I wouldn't be surprised if they did it, but it's, um, uh, you know, supposedly this, this is what like Bollinger does in France with their RD. They age it on cork rather than on crown caps. Uh, Good enough. All right, and now Christy, go ahead. Give us a minute on, on Piquet. I'm going to real quick um, put a link in. Now I got to find you guys. I lost you. All right, I'm just sharing the screen just because we are close to the end time. Uh, just to let you know that next time will be October 18. Um, and we will talk about microoxygenation and oxidation management. And stay with us. We are going to talk about piquet. No. So, is anybody out there making piquet? Which is the byproducts of the winemaking and you. Um, yeah, and you, and it, you get like a, a lower, um, alcohol, uh, fuzzy wine in a bottle and we just cap it like a beer cap. So you're, you're talking about taking what comes out of the press of, of white grapes, right. let's say. Yeah. And, and adding, adding some, some sugar, sugar and, some and, water, and water and some yeast, yeast and, and it ferments in the bottle and you get. Um, so it has some of the characteristics that you spoke of with the pet net. Um, and at first I thought the 
when I first saw it, I thought, oh, I thought it was spelled paquette, but then I, I see that they're two different things. Yeah, it, it works really well. Uh, it's a little bit lighter uh, in flavor profile. Obviously, it, it's not using the actual juice, um, but it is a little bit of residual. Uh, you know, if you're doing uh, um, red grapes like a Marquette or Frontenac, uh, you know, you can make a really nice uh, light rosé style with that piquet. Um, it, it, it's just another way of being sustainable, uh, using up and making a secondary product. Um, and then it's also another great way to, by doing that same type of fermentation, if you are, uh, have a distillation process, you can make grappa. Um, but, uh, this it's great for, uh, cocktails, mixers, uh, on its own. Um, it's, it's definitely a great way to, you know, stretch. Uh, your grapes and your product, your harvest out a little bit further and uh, be able to recoup some more uh, profitability. It's a, it's and, a great option. And the um, people love the story, just like the pet, you know, it's something different and trying that style and hearing the story behind it. I need to, we need to check with the TTB on what our options are for right now. We're making it and giving it away as part of some of our farm to table dinners. Um, but we are going to explore if, how we how we label it, bottle it, and sell it. I, I seem to remember, Ode, maybe you know, I seem to remember once reading that there was a law in France against paying uh, the vineyard workers with piquette. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I worked in Burgundy, uh, what we called it, we didn't call it piquette, we called it la boite, which means the wheelbarrow. And that was, that was what uh, you paid, the, that's what you gave the vineyard workers. And, uh, oh God, I still remember going, making the rounds of, of the workers that lived in the village uh, with my winemaker. And every one of them would bring out this very acidic, very green wine was low in alcohol. And by the end of the day, our stomachs were churning. And, uh, oh. Yeah. Oh, acid. Is, yeah. All right. If you are interested in making piquettes, I would be very interested too, to be in contact with you. Because I'm looking at a way to add value to the waste, the common waste of winemaking. So, and I'm gonna, work still with you, Christy and Kent, hopefully on this year on the piquet. Yes, good. We we're going to look to actually be bottling it and selling it. We've had really good feedback from it. So yep. you know and I and I would think actually that the hybrids work better than vinifera because the hybrids are much more aromatic. And so even with watering down, you're going to get a lot of components in there that are lost in the vinifera. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you're, uh, you have plenty of acid, so even though you're going to be diluting the acid, it's still going to be there so that you're going to have, uh, you know, that liveliness. And you can drink it for lunch and stay productive in the afternoon. That's all the <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking to a group here that can drink anything for lunch. And I know. <laughs> we're so well exercised, but not everybody can do it as well yeah. as me. Can I ask a question about that? And Yeah. And maybe I missed it. Um, are you using fresh pressed grapes or already fermented grapes? Uh, the fresh pressed grapes. Okay. So grape grapes used for either rosé or white wine making. Yeah. And, and I've done both. Um, okay. So. We did all. Yeah, we did our petite pearl. So we did all of them. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that, that we have not gris and petite pearl. I think those we have two different pet nets. Right. Um, and I, I actually prefer the front net gris pet net over front net gris wine. Um, it's actually fantastic. So the the petite pearl was after alcoholic fermentation and MLF maybe if you did do MLF. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. It would have been. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank Good. you all for a wonderful discussion. Michael, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Oh, uh, thank uh, you for Ode the invitation. Has up, Ode has put up the slide here and uh, it has both her email and I my email. 
uh, the winemakers. You just need to hunt them down at their wineries. Michael uh, uh, Michael Jones, of course, uh, uh, works at uh, for Scott Labs, and uh, I, I noticed uh, you don't you don't mind people knowing your your email and your phone number, Michael. You're easy, no, to, get no, a, the, easy uh, to get a hold I, of. I get lonely here otherwise. <laughs> well, wonderful. Uh, thank you again, all of you, for your participation. I I uh, I, I I think we're getting into the late part of the day. Yeah. Yeah, thank you everybody for your participation. It was great to have that great discussion about all types of sparkling sparkling wine. Uh so as I mentioned, we will see all of you October 18 or sooner, but otherwise have a good harvest time, a good season and feel free to take the survey. That's free. It's just going to take 2 5 minutes. You're going to receive an email. So um and I think that's it. Thanks for being with us and have a good season. Thank you. Happy Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good harvest, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. Happy winemaking. <laughs> Thanks.